Dear viewers, welcome to the second webinar of our webinar series, Essay Contest Winners Forum, facilitated by the Gold Peace Foundation. My name is Patrick Petit. I am a, a staff member of the Gold Peace Foundation, and I will be the moderator of this webinar today. Today's webinar addresses peacemaking and reconciliation in post-conflict societies, and therefore, I have the great privilege to have uh, Kitty uh, Kandelaki from Georgia and Neda Zimic from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Both are coming from uh, countries which have uh, faced wars and civil wars and conflict in modern history, and therefore they're going to share their wisdom and thoughts on, uh, on that topic. The topic being peacemaking and reconciliation in post-conflict societies. But before we are starting with the topic and getting to this conversation, I'm going to ask uh, Neda to share uh, with uh, all of us, you know, what uh, you are doing today after you won the uh, essay contest for young people. Neda? So, good afternoon. My name is Neda Simic and I'm 14 years old. I am Bosnian Serb, but I'm currently living in London. I am 2017 essay contest winner. I must say that it was a huge experience, it's such an honor to present my winning essay on the award ceremony. I have not only defeated my fears and gained self-confidence, by presenting my essay, but also learned a lot from the debate that came afterwards in the ceremony. It was an astonishing experience uh, that helped me grow as a, as a person, even though I was only 12. And it also taught me to appreciate more the chance I was given to meet new people and new culture. Um, it also gave me a lot of hope and encouraged me to write more and be confident. Um, so it really was an opportunity that comes only once in life and it's a need to learn the most of it. Thank you. So it made a great impact on you having won this uh, uh, international essay contest as you just shared with us. And really yes. And uh, Katie, what can you remember you know, from Hello. one? Uh -huh. Thank you for hosting this uh, webinar. For me, it's a big honor to participate. Um, I'm coming from Georgia. My name is Katie Kandelaki, and I have won this essay contest in 2001. At the time, I was uh, 19 years old, and I was a student. Um, I, I studied it, uh, in Bulgaria, far away from my country. And um, since then, I have been traveling a lot as well. Uh, so for me, uh, it was also a, a big honor uh, to be chosen as a winner. And um, for me, it was also uh, opening my heart and mind to new uh, thoughts, uh, new ideas, new initiatives that people have for the, for the harmony and the peace in our societies and in, in the world. And also, um, I felt a great responsibility towards other people who didn't have the chance to participate in the, uh, in the ceremony, in the declaration of all life on earth. So it felt a big responsibility to share whatever I have felt and realized, because uh, in order to, for us to be successful, we need to all participate equally and have equal uh, spirit uh, that uh, will drive us towards a better future. So I have been sharing my experience extensively since then in any setting that I have been. Um, and I think that the, the fire that was uh, injected in me at that time is still, still burning um, despite so many years. Uh, and I think that this is what, uh, what's important uh, to be constantly constantly sharing the spirit of uh, harmony and peace for, with anyone that you meet. Um, and this will 
for sure uh, make us um, build a better future for, for ourselves and for, for our future generations. Uh, thank you. And particularly, you're definitely making a big difference in your country by bringing up uh, peace and, uh, and harmony within, within your nation. And your nation which particularly needs uh, so much uh, you know, healing you know, after you know, having faced uh, a great conflict. You know. So uh, we are even now going to dive immediately into the, the topic of today of peace and reconciliation in post-conflict uh, societies. You are just living you know, in, uh, in Georgia, you know, a country which has reached independence after the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union the beginning of the, the 90s and immediately after the, um, the collapse of the, the Soviet Union and uh, Georgia declaring itself as an independent country, there have been some, immediately some region uh, within Georgia, uh, Ossetia and Abkhazia who are, you know, who are declaring their own independence. So it created a sort of civil conflict at the same time, uh, Russia, you know, was uh, putting a lot of pressure of your country, which led even to a, to a invasion of Russia in 2008. So based on what you have witnessed and on in your, your experience, can you share with us what, uh, you know, what an episode which have particularly, you know, uh, influenced you or, or you have particular in mind which have deeply impacted you? Uh, when the conflict started, uh, it was uh, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, as you correctly mentioned, Patrick. So I was around nine years old when it uh, all started. And um, it was a drastically different world before and after. So it meant that um, people uh, were deprived of the basic, uh, basic things in life, uh, of electricity, of, um, of uh, heating, of uh, food. And uh, it meant that for us, uh, our, um, our parents had to face a new reality that they were not prepared to face. So it meant total readjustment of your mind um, with the reality that you are in conflict with a large, um, large country. And you, you are a very small country and you are in conflict and you have to um, basically cope with it and survive as a nation. Um, it was a huge uh, shock for everyone in the country, and I felt uh, this shock in, in any any person that I would uh, interact with. Uh, how do we uh, get over the uh, day to day? So it was every day was a struggle, and you had to just finish the day, and it was a, already a win. So for me, it meant uh, it meant that I also had to readjust to this new reality and just to think of, of this uh, small amount of time that you have to cope with. And this helped us to survive. Like if you survive today, you survive tomorrow, for sure you will be able to survive. And then suddenly, a little bit by a little by little, we started to think, so how do we uh, think long-term? What do we have to do to survive in a longer, not tomorrow, but, but in a year, five years, 10 years, what, what are the things that you have to do to survive? So this was, this was a progression of, uh, of, uh, of thinking uh, that helped us uh, to uh, form as a, as a nation and as an independent country. Uh, and it helped us throughout these years as well. Um, Georgia has been in attention with uh, our neighboring country for all those years so uh, there had been periods of uh, uh, relative um, peacefulness but the uh, the conflict is there it has not disappeared uh, our country is uh, part 20 percent or more is occupied by our neighboring country and uh, some and sometimes people are divided by the barbed wire so it's like the families cannot talk to each other because the border is shifted and shifted uh, to make our country smaller and smaller. So the, the conflict is still very uh, active and it's uh, still uh, very raw 
So um, nothing has changed since then in terms of conflict resolution. Uh, so I think that now we, we are now learning to find the, the ways that will help us solve it in, in the longer future, because we understood that today, okay, you cannot do something drastic. You cannot solve it within, within one day. But if you think of the strategies that will help you uh, solve the conflict in a longer term perspective, then maybe you will be more successful. And that's, that is the way that our country is going on now. So we are thinking of the ways that will enable us to solve the conflict in a, in a mid-term future, probably. Mm -hmm. And again, you see a specific factor in which uh, you see uh, some light behind the tunnel where there is some attempts of reconciliation and approach within uh, the various, let me say, ethnic uh, groups within Georgia, as well as with, with the Russian Federation? Georgians are very, uh, uh, Georgians are a very uh, hospitable nation. We are very tolerant to differences and we are very hospitable to everyone who visits us. Uh, this is what we are known for and we are proud of this uh, profile that we have. So uh, whenever a person from the, conf from the conflicting country comes to visit us, we, we are very loving and open and we try to show them everything that we have and to spread the love. Uh, so uh, I think this is what, so what will help us in future as well. We have never stopped um, respecting the people uh, from the, these regions. Uh, from Russia. Uh, we always welcome them as tourists, as guests. Uh, we are always very open and do our best to impress them. Uh, and I think whenever there is such a connection on a, on a human level between uh, people, ordinary people, uh, this is something that builds up. Uh, it doesn't happen in a day and you should not uh, imagine that if you have tourists and you make them spend a very good time and they go back to, to their country that they next day the conflict will disappear and uh, everything everyone will be happy. No, it doesn't happen that way, but uh, 10 people realize what, what they have seen, 20, 30, it all builds up. Uh, and uh, I think this is, uh, uh, this is where I see the bright future that when you build up something, eventually it shows. So it's something that is still underwater, but I think gradually um, there will be a, a collective, collective notion that uh, this is this country and these are its borders and you have to respect those borders. And if you do so, this will be a loving country that can welcome you at any time and you don't need their territories. So uh, I think this is where uh, the, the success lies in uh, bit by bit building the uh, build, building this um, general notion among the general people that this is what what it, it should be mm -hmm. so and I I also mentioned to you last time we spoke that my sister lives in Moscow and uh, I used to visit her time at a time and she used to visit me uh, and now uh, two weeks ago or, or a week ago uh, Russia has declared that uh, its uh, citizens are not allowed to travel to Georgia anymore uh, because they brought tourism to our country and uh, helped our uh, economy. So um, Russia said that uh, it doesn't allow its, uh, its ordinary people to visit the country anymore via uh, air travel. So it means that um, we have find to, to find another way to meet. Uh, and this is especially um, uh, hard for us because um, she, she's my sister and I, I love her dearly and I always want to see her, but this uh, big divide is uh, dividing uh, us uh, um, technically, but it has nothing to do with the, with the bond that we have. So these technical divisions uh, have the, uh, the um, effect that we want to see each other even more. And if we would schedule two visits per year, now we will visit, schedule five visits per year, just because we are not allowed to. So um, 
Um, I think this is the, the driving force behind the peacemaking. Mm -hmm. no, thank you for sharing. And particularly, uh, I see in peacemaking and reconciliation, these are small steps, you know, to go day by day, you know, and uh, particularly to keep the, the trust, you know, then that reconciliation is possible despite of some setbacks from time to time, but still holding as an individual and as a nation, you know, the, the, the spirit high that, uh, that uh, peace is possible and uh, reconciliation is possible within the country. And thank you. And uh, uh, Neda, uh, you, uh, you have been born in a country, namely Bosnia and Herzegovina, which also in, in recent history has known some uh, dramatic war after the dissolution of uh, Yugoslavia. After that, I think it was in 1994, when, uh, when Bosnia and Herzegovina declared independence. And just after that, the Balkan War started. So you haven't even been born at, at that time, but you have maybe heard from, from your parents or from your relatives. Uh, before I speak about the conflict, I had to explain what uh, led to it. So in 1990s on Balkan, uh, there was a country called Yugoslavia. It was made out of six republics, um, Serbia, Croatia, Montenegro, Macedonia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and um, um, yeah, uh, Slovenia, Serbia, Croatia, Montenegro, Macedonia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, due to big economic crisis in many countries, uh, debts and uh, financial collapses, the hate between the nations was drastically rising. And uh, so some of the countries uh, wanted independence um, and believed that was the solution for the problem. But other countries uh, believed that staying in Yugoslavia was for the better tomorrow. Uh, so big problem ho was how to equally separate the property from the common country. And uh, the biggest problem was that the borders between the republics were not ethnically clear. So like that, when, when one of the republics wants to separate itself, um, it's carrying um, other nations that don't want to separate and their property with it. So in 1992, in my part of Yugoslavia, uh, which is Bosnia and Herzegovina, the war started. Uh, there were three constructive nations in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, those were Bosnian Croats, uh, Bosniaks and Bosnian Serbs. It is important to say that um, all three uh, nations were, um, had three different religions, um, which played a big role. So Bosniaks um, were Muslims, Bosnian Serbs were Orthodox Christians, and Bosnian Croats were Catholics. Um, Bosnian Croats and Bosniaks wanted independence, whereas Bosnian Serbs wanted to stay in Yugoslavia. So this war had a lot of victories and refugees on all three sides. And um, it's really sad that a lot of families lost their family members. And let's not even talk about children and childhood that they lost, and some of them even their lives. Um, I know that from the first hand, my mother felt that on her own skin. Um, my mom was a refugee. She lost her house in the war. Um, it was burned by the opposite side. And um, her parents, my grandparents, um, had to run away with uh, three of their children and start everything again from the scratch. So they had to start over, even if it's not easy, but they didn't really have an option. Um, uh, my grandparents themselves were orphans uh, from the Second World War, so um, it was really hard for them to go through all of that over and over again. Um, I believe this war was meaningless and the people suffered great losses for meaningless things. Um, only profit made the politicians uh, that even after the war ended tried to make problems between the nations because it suited them like that. But um, it was 
a great loss for everyone in the country and um, every adult I know from Bosnia and Herzegovina has their part of the story and their loss which is really heartbreaking to listen uh, from my childhood. It's really horrible to think about it when someone, it might be the person that you live next to, that you were friends for many years and many years and suddenly this war happens and everything and you start being enemies with them. It's just impossible to think about it in your head. So some people um, um, think um, uh, Croatians started the war, some people think Bosniaks started it or Serbs, but um, there are really three different stories um, of the war in, um, in this country. But um, only certain thing is the, that the peace um, wasn't, uh, was introduced by the foreign politicians by signing the 18 agreement in 1995. So the agreement specifically said uh, which piece of land be, uh, belonged to whom and um, what amount of power did each people have and who rules the country. That is why Bosnia does not have one president. It has a political body out of three representatives uh, from each nation. So, um, yes, the peace was introduced and um, uh, the war um, conflicts are ended, but um, when you um, look at the states of Bosnia, you can clearly see that um, peace between the nations is not uh, totally um, brought. So um, you think uh, that um, um, you think that it will not come um, to peace soon uh, because we still have three different nations in Bosnia that feel that they don't belong to their country. On the other hand, we can say that peace was never accomplished because of politics and economics. Um, it still plays a big role in Bosnia in which uh, political party you in. And some nations in Bosnia do, do not want to admit that they had taken the part in the war, not only by being victims, but also by being aggressors. So doing that, they do not respect the victims and losses of the others. If we are talking about the peace, we can't still, after 34 years, um, 34 years after the war ended, we can't point fingers at each other and accuse, but only admit taking the part and pay respect to the victims and look forward to the future. So um, it's all the people won't forget what happened, obviously, because uh, of the major loss they experienced. But I think um, that it's all on the younger generations and how they are going to change um, our society. Uh, younger generations uh, care more about the quality of our lives than, than the actual segregation between the nations. So um, it's all about uh, the better education of younger people because, you know, um, uh, parents of school ch children even um, um, said that it's not okay because uh, um, uh, um, children from each end nation learn different history in school. So um, every perspective of the war is learned differently for every nation. So um, it's all on children to um, uh, look at the wider picture, not only to think what is best for myself, but to look what is, well, what, what is the best for our all, all society and um, to think outside of the bo box, basically, um, to bring the peace inside the society by uh, being kind and considerate about each other. And there are actually many organizations um, in high school and in elementary schools that join all three nations together that stop the segregation between the nations and help each other, um, help the children to grow um, more um, as people and to um, 
bring the peace in society. As Neda correctly mentioned, uh, history is taught differently in different nations. So uh, the perspective that we get in Georgia is different from the perspective that children in, in Russia get or in, on in, or in our um, regions that are now in conflict. So um, this is true, but also it's true that we now live in a different reality than, for example, even 10 years ago. Um, children who are now in schools have access to uh, uh, Facebook, Instagram, So at the moment, uh, your picture is just uh, frozen. So in the meantime, all, uh, the, pers all the perspective okay. is is shared between uh, the countries. So uh, we are now connected in a different way than before. We are now connected via this uh, network uh, called internet, which allows us to share information, to get the perspective, to get quick access to data, to check the information that was given by us through media, through, through schools, through, through the means of people who want us to know something in a way. So we can quickly check it and make up our own minds what's going on in reality. Yes, the media, media the television is still very uh, powerful, but it's becoming less and less powerful. So now uh, the people who are now in schools who are now students have different perspective. They have different um, uh, ideas. They uh, don't conform to the to the uh, general uh, line that is given to them. They always challenge it. So it means that uh, for us, it's even um, easier to find ways for reconciliation than before. So uh, because we live in a different reality, we don't. It, it would not be good for us to use the same tools that we used 10 years ago, five years ago, 20 years ago, to make peace in, in this year, in 2019 or 20, or in a perspective. We have to change the ways, we have to change the tools, we have to open our minds and listen to the, to the people who are now uh, small, but they have a different mindset. They, they are open in ways that we would not never imagine. So these are the people who have the power to change the reality because what a human needs is basic uh, safety, food, and then needs a connection to the society, needs affirmation from the society, needs a good uh, family, love, and job. And that's, that's the basic needs. Everyone is the same in any country. So uh, these are not the aspirations that these people have. They have different aspirations from the politicians. So whenever they come to power, these young people, they will say that I don't want to live in this reality. I, I'm sure that they will find another ways to, uh, to make peace. So uh, what I think is that we have to give these people platform to speak. We have to give these people opportunity to participate in, in peacemaking, in lawmaking. Uh, these young people have to be present in any decision-making processes that happen in any country. I think this is uh, the major tool that we can use to build uh, uh, peaceful societies in our future. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed, you know, the young generation in your country, as well as in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and probably in, in other, you know, conflict regions, they are the ones with different mindsets, you know, with different mentality, you know, different from their, their parents, from their grandparents. They have a completely different approach and, uh, and mindset. They want reconciliation, they want peace, they want uh, sustainable you know, growth and, and development and uh, living uh, you know, in good neighborhood with others. So there's a great hope you know, that this new generation will really, once it really takes uh, leadership, you know, that it makes a big, big difference in the world and uh, contribute to create you know, peace around the planet. Uh, I just heard now that uh, Rogers uh, Kimuli is uh, is uh, is there. Uh, Rogers, hi. So this is Rogers uh, Kimuli from Rwanda. He's uh, uh, contacting us from uh, Nairobi, Kenya. 
So thank you very much, Rogers, you know, to, uh, to join us within our conversation on today's uh, webinar on the reconciliation and uh, peacemaking. And uh, Rogers, I immediately, you know, ask you, you know, you have been, you know, five years old or four to five years old when in your country, you know, and this is, uh, you know, known around the world, you know, even uh, the United Nations at the time, Kofi Annan even saw it as his biggest, let me say, failure, failure in his, uh, in his uh, job as UN Secretary General, that, that he allowed it even to happen that, you know, uh, a genocide occurred in your country in 1994 starting uh, 6th of April until July. So, so now, now 25 years ago, you know, you had been, uh, uh, you know, a genocide occurring in your country. When you are, you have been a small kid at that time, you know, but what have you experienced or witnessed something, uh, you know, what, what occurred at that time? Or what have you heard from your relatives and your parents? You know, can you share some, some episode of, of that, uh, what occurred 25 years ago? within Rwanda. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Patrick. Um, and thank you very much to, to the whole team that has been uh, working hand in hand to make sure that this webinar happens. Uh, my apologies, uh, it's been a little bit hectic to make sure away from home I get to connect and also I get to be able uh, to put um, uh, everything in place that is necessary. Uh, for this webinar, um, but uh, joining you, uh, I would like to thank you very much for the question that you've just shared. Um, for us as Rwandans, for the last 25 years, uh, it's been a hectic journey. It's not been very simple, to be honest, uh, but personally, as a young man, uh, I started hearing about the genocide because, um, uh, you know, the genocide of Rwanda is not, is not a just a click that it happened in a one day. It was being prepared for a long period of time. It was in someone's agenda that it gets to happen. There was identification, there was plans, there was, you know, all the steps of the genocide that were being put in place. There was dehumanization, people being called snakes and cockroaches, so that someone gets to feel that you're dehumanized. You're not someone that has to be respected as human. You know, there was so much planning that went on. So in 19... In 1959, there was a pilot project to kind of give a try if the genocide can really happen in Rwanda. Um, the Hutus were being given the all available materials to make sure they tried the pilot. So in 1959, they tried it and it happened. So some of the Tutsis left the country. That's when now my grandparents left. But some of the Tutsis uh, chose to stay uh, within the country by then. Uh, but then what you realize is that um, as a young man growing up, my parents have been talking about what happened in the genocide. And this is what happened. And that's how it impacted me as a young person to be working uh, on peace building in my community today, uh, is that the genocide that happened in Rwanda, and of course there are many other genocides that were, we have been reading about, the Holocaust um, in Cambodia, that there was a number. But then what you realize is Rwanda's genocide against the Tutsi was specifically between two different groups that were speaking the same language and they were living in the same area. They were neighbors, you know? So they were being told how much they were different and they were being told that you should hate on this person because this is a cockroach. This is not a human being. This is a snake, as they called it last. Uh, 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 they called them inyenzi locally. So that word means a cockroach. Inzoka that means a snake. Now they use the biblical theory that whenever man meets a snake, man should always be an enemy to snake. So using the biblical perception, it was the worst thing because Christianity had just hit uh, within the African communities and then everyone grabbed that hatred. And then what she realizes, it was so deep hatred to the extent, even a mother who was married to a Tutsi 
who was a Hutu, was being ordered to remove the pregnancy from a Tutsi father. So you can imagine how much that was. And then for me, what hit me so much was when the children who didn't even know what was going on was being slaughtered as snake, as they said. A mother of nine children, and I'll share with you the book. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I think I'll share it a little bit later. But the book talks about a woman who had nine children, but because the father of the children was a Tutsi, she had to take these nine kids to the killers or the perpetrators who were the Hutus by the time to kill them. Your own children. Now for us, in, when we're uh, in exile in Uganda, is when you would see the flow of blood from Lake Victoria, River Nile, uh, you see how much dehumanized people were. The flowing of people tied up and all that. So it devolved so much hatred, uh, uh, most especially in, in us. So when you come back home, all you want to do is to revenge on whoever killed your family. Because when you come home, you realize many of the members that stayed in Rwanda were being killed our grandparents, our uncles, who stayed, all of them died. So for us, you develop a grudge and you want to revenge. But then it's very unfortunate you realize when you get home, your parents' agenda of fighting back to, gain, to regain their land wasn't to go and revenge. Now, on the contrary, you realize they're actually calling for more dialogue with their children to understand that we came back home to build peace. Now, that's where I stand today, that I came back as a, as a wanting to revenge young person, like many others, and then today I have a very different heart, and I, and I have a heart of forgiveness and a heart of peace building. Unity and reconciliation is what is in me right now. And, and what, thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. And what, what created that shift within you, you know, wanting to come back, we need to revenge, you know, and then all of a sudden, this shift, you know, of, of all of a sudden becoming a peacemaker and, and uh, you know, creating reconciliation and, and healing the wounds within your, your nation. Yes, uh, uh, specifically Rwanda, it was the drive. Um, and I would like to give an example. I uh, just imagine my brother Tatur. Tatur is my big brother. Maybe for me, I'm still very young, so I can't go for war. But then if someone excavates us out of our land and says the glass is full, is like it, it, the country is like a glass full of water that a type of people who are the Tutsis by the time, we are not allowed to be in the country. So when the glass is full, you cannot add on water. So the government of the perpetrators, that's what they were saying, which was the Hutu government by the time. It was called the Hutu power. So... When your big brother Tatul and other big brothers within the community plan and say we are going back home, but then we are going back home with an agenda. Are we going back home to revenge or are we going back home to build peace? And then they agreed that they're going back home not to revenge, but to regain their land. Two, they're going back home to have peace, to build a new economy, to build a new country where everyone can live with the other. And then the agenda was very clear. So your big brother comes back fighting, but then after fighting, he retakes over the land and then they get to leave that land and then they call you back home. Now, Rogers, you can come back home and of course with our parents, with of course our mamas and papas, you come back home and then you realize that as much as you have the agenda to revenge, but it's a different aspect that your brothers had. Now they start taking you through what was the agenda when they stood to say, we are fighting back to make sure that we regain our land. We didn't come back home to revenge. We are going to support you. We're going to make sure you go to school. We are going to make sure you have food. We are going to make sure everything is in your hands. But one thing we are going to request you 
we know very well the perpetrator cannot give you anything now because they cannot bring back uh, your mother's life, not your father's life, not your brother's life, not your sister's life. Truth is, when they are killed, of course, they are dead. But do you think the perpetrator is going to give you the life of those people? There's only one thing that is available, though. You can give something, and that was very imperative. It is only the victims that had something to give, but the perpetrators had nothing to give. What could they give? They would give, they would give the forgiveness part of their heart to bring it on the table and forgive the perpetrators. Now that's what the big brother was requesting the young ones. Now when our parents were requesting the children to forgive, the, 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 the uncles to forgive and everyone, you realize that they would call for dialogue. They would call for gachacha courts, but then put in hands the judgment into the hands into the hands of the judgment to be into the hands of the uh, the victims. So gachacha courts, I don't know if you heard about it, but these are traditional courts that were being used in the traditional Rwandan culture, but then later on they were being revived to be used into uh, the serving of the Rwandans. For it, it is not about just judging and making sure that some cases are prosecuted, but they were about that the end part of the Gachacha courts are always to forgive and to make sure there is harmony between the two, whether the victim or the perpetrator. So when the Gachacha courts were introduced, you realize that so many of our families, mostly on the Tutsi side, they were all going through the gachacha courts. It will take you time sometime. It will take you years. But your big brothers are still requesting that you forgive the perpetrator. But whenever you would forgive the perpetrator, they would be out of the prison. So, so many of these cases have happened. There's so much of uh, uh, programs that were being introduced. Some programs like Goy Peace Foundation is introducing, making sure the young people are involved. But on most greatest point and imperative point that the government of Rwanda has put in place is mostly the inclusion of everyone on the journey that we are taking as a, as a country to go and, and to grow and to thrive and be a thriving community. It includes everyone, whether Tutsi, whether Hutu, whether whoever that is, is alive in our country, whether the Twas, everyone is given a chance to be part of the development of this country. So I think inclusion and respect for everyone uh, was really a very big part into whether the dialogue, whether the forgiveness part of it, whether the peace building, whether the community building, and that was very imperative in everything that the Rwandan government has managed to do, but also the people. It's not very easy to forgive, but, but if you is. give it a chance and an environment to forgive and you still do, it is amazing. But it is really amazing. This is really amazing. This, this policy of, of reconciliation through forgiveness, you know, from both sides, what, ha what occurred in Rwanda so now, the, so now, uh, more than, now than 25 years is really also an example, you know, for, for the world, you know, for, for uh, you know, resolving conflicts and, uh, and reconcile, particularly in post-conflict uh, societies. So this is really a, a great, a great model to the world, which uh, Rwanda politicians, as well as the society as a whole, you know, are all doing. Thank you for sharing. And uh, Neda, you know, I like to ask you what is your personal, you know, uh, approach to to uh, reconciliations in your country. What have, what is your contribution, and you and uh, for creating peace and harmony within your country in Bosnia, Herzegovina. So um, I moved to London one year ago, which means that I've lived in Bosnia, Herzegovina for 13 years. And I can say that, um, so I was a part of many organizations that um, join all the students together, no matter of our nationality or religion, we're all together and working. And I think that is the key of um, 
uh, actual peace and reconciliation between us because um, 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 actually uh, the answer is the uh, Goy Peace Foundation's um, essay contest theme this year which is creating um, society for kindness so um, we were learning how to be kind to each other how to um, unite um, understand each other that's really important uh, to understand that we've all went through great loss all sides um, went through unimaginable losses but to put all that behind us and uh, to have respect to, um, towards each other um, um, and um, to basically to understand uh, each other, respect and be kind to each other. I think those three things are um, the things we need to pay the most attention to. Mm -hmm. Particularly the small acts of kindness which done, done every day, day by day are really the ones you know how to reconcile society and to recreate peace and harmony within society and, and trust you know uh, among each other. Yes, that's really true. Thank you. And uh, Katie, you know, what is your personal, you know, contribution to heal the wounds of, of Georgia, of your country, your personal, you know, contribution to it? Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the personal contribution that I, I make, and uh, I think that is um, uh, bare minimum that I could be doing now, and I could be doing a lot more, uh, is uh, first of all spreading the positivity uh, in order for us to think positively as a, as a society. Uh, if you think positively, uh, for sure you'll find a way uh, to overcome any issues that you have, especially so with the conflicts when when it's so easy to get desperate and it's so easy to just give up, uh, you have to think that uh, there are ways that we can overcome this conflict. You have to look at the good examples. You have to uh, make yourself think positively and um, make others think positively as well. So both the negativity and the positivity are very contagious. So if we uh, make ourselves think of the better future and see it as a reality uh, and accept that this is possible for us, for a society, for a neighboring countries, for Georgia and Russia to be peaceful, to coexist in, in this, uh, on this planet, then uh, it becomes so that the way starts to uh, show itself too. So um, as a, as a um, uh, citizen of my country, what I can do is to uh, be outspoken uh, active in the media, active uh, with the, the social media, active with the friends, with all the, all the people all around the world that I interact with who ask me questions like what is going on in Georgia, what do you think will happen? I always say that everything is going to be all right because I'm, I'm sure that it will be and I, I'm hopeful that in other countries uh, there will be a better future and um, I think this is possible and uh, we just have to believe that this is possible and then find the ways of doing it. So for me, uh, coming to Japan uh, at the age of 19 was eye-opening. And the work that I saw that uh, the employees of Koi Foundation did uh, and the, the work that you have been guys doing for all over the years, this dedication, uh, for me, this is a huge responsibility for the rest of us who are now just working uh, and or, or studying or doing whatever we are doing. It's a huge responsibility that you have taken this big burden on yourselves, uh, working so hard for this, um, for our better future. And I think that this is a bare minimum that we can be doing, just spreading the good word and uh, uh, day by day building a small bricks that, that can help us uh, in future as well. And just maybe also we have to be more encouraging to the to the people who are active in this field, like you and Tsuro. And uh, this is a great respect that I'm talking from because for me, you you are the role models who are like soldiers working on the on the field every day, 
because the resistance is very large. So the um, people who uh, feed from the conflicts, uh, they, they are very strong. So uh, I think this is a war that uh, is ongoing. Uh, and I think that uh, if we think positively, if we reinforce each other, if we say that this, what you have done is good, this is something to be copied, this is something to be spread, then it's going to be um, a better future for everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so staying positive and having a positive uh, mindset and uh, spreading you know, uh, hope and, uh, and harmony this is the f basics, you know, for, for reconciliation and uh, rebuilding societies. And, uh, you know, uh, Nida, which also said that, uh, that the acts of, of kindness, in addition to it, you know, are also, you know, contributing to uh, building uh, peaceful societies as well. So, uh, thank you. And uh, Rogers, what uh, is your personal approach to reconcile, you know, uh, your country? Particularly, you have a specific approach, right? Uh, it's through environmental, you know, um, healing, you know, as a, almost like a therapy, you know, for, for, for healing traumas, traumatism within people in your, in your country. Can you share this with us a little bit more? Uh, yes. Um... Thank you very much, Mr. Patrick, and I'd like to thank very much uh, Katie and Neda um, for their sharing. Um, um, as you can imagine, of course, in Rwanda, the intensity of how much human was being uh, very much distorted, and also how humanity as a concept was distorted. Um, this, when you look at the difference you know, human conflicts and you realize sometimes it was inevitable. But then in Rwanda, if someone was killing someone, they spoke the same language. So if I was craving for life, you knew I was craving for life, at least not the language that was different. So the intensity of our conflict and also the intensity at which the genocide of Rwanda happened was really very deep. Now, as you can imagine, it is really a long journey. Rwanda and our leaders, and of course, the biggest credit, we give it to our, uh, our uh, best leader, we call him our father, our blessed father, Mr. Paul Kagame, is the one who has really uh, managed to, to drive us through this process. And also our different leaders who have been on the engine of making sure that the young people in specific are included on the journey of making sure that units and reconciliation in the country uh, uh, is being achieved. But how are we going about it specifically at my organization, which is Journey House Actions Day? What we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that the children, if you want to, to, to heal our country, so many, uh, we are the first generation after the genocide, but uh, you still find a lot of you know, the different clinging grudges on the hearts of the different young people because they talked about it with, you know, their parents. But then you realize is when the community want to heal right, the children need to be trained right. So now our special focus has been specifically on children and women. But how? We are making sure that our community comes together through uh, the environmental connection, the environmental healing. We have in a program that is uh, bringing a permaculture concept into peace building. So that is environmental connection of the children, the way they touch the ground, that connection of nature to human, the peace that you gain when you connect to nature, when you connect to the soil, the energy that you would feel, the positive energy from, from the nature, from the therapeutic gardens that we are, uh, we are trying to create. So in the same way, uh, you know, I was in Kenya trying to, to learn from the International Peace Initiative uh, in, in, in Meru, close to mountain, mountain Kenya. Um, it was about the same thing. How could the environment connect 
into peace building. That's what we're trying to bring within the concept to make sure that peace building is being achieved because everything that we have to do on this, in this world, without nature, I don't see any peace coming up really. That's why we're having a lot of uh, issues today. You've got about um, different natural calamities, earthquakes, uh, 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 strong winds, the, the tsunamis and all that. So this need for human to understand that climate change is hitting us right and there's no peace that is coming. We still have human to human issue, but then we still also have to make sure that our environment is favoring everything that we're trying to do to make sure that we have a peaceful life. So in our way, that's what we're trying to do, but also to create an environment that every young people every grown-up person, every, whether Hutu or Tutsi, because today in Rwanda, Hutu and Tutsi is no longer an identity. We are all Rwandans under the program called Ndumia Rwanda. We are dialoguing about being Rwandans instead of being a different Hutu or a different Tutsi or a different Twa. See, they don't talk about Twa because they were not so much engaged, but they existed. But the Tutsis and the Hutus were so much into the genocide and the implications and the repercussions of the genocide really hit these two groups so much because the victims were mostly, mostly the Tutsis and the perpetrators were the Hutus. But today, we believe that that environment that we are going to be creating is going to give us space to dialogue and reconcile and to unify the community but through the green nature that we are going to be creating within the community. So that's what we're trying to do. And we've done it for the last uh, closer to uh, five years now, doing the different gardening, community gardening, and then to make sure that Tutsis and Hutus or, or Twas, but that all Rwandans come together and, and do the work. So in that way, they tend to uh, to talk to each other, to get to know each other, and to harmonize a lot that we're trying to achieve. Hence, peace uh, and unity in our community. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for, for sharing. So we are now coming to an end of this today webinar. So thank you so much, uh, Roger and uh, Neda and Katie, for having shared your, your wisdom and insight and experiences on uh, peace building and uh, reconciliation within your countries, within your nations. Uh, Ketty in uh, Georgia, Neda in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and uh, Rogers in Rwanda, probably around Africa since you are now in, uh, in Kenya. So thank you very much for, for your, your insights.